And tonight, a shocking new video surfaces from Wisconsin, where an angry mob of pro-union protesters chased down and heckled GOP state senator Glenn Grothman yesterday. And this is what happened. After several minutes of Grothman being blockaded by the mob at a locked entrance, Democratic State Representative Brett Holsey stepped in and attempted to calm this crowd. I've been with you here for two and a half weeks along with all of our Assembly Democrats. Thank you. The most important thing about this whole event is it has been peaceful and respectful. Now, with the help of Holsey and some firefighters, Grothman was eventually able to get into the Capitol building safely. But my next guest says this is just more evidence of the thuggish tactics of the left-wing unions. Joining me now, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Culture of Corruption, Michelle Malkin, is back with us. Uh, Michelle, th that is, to me, is a frightening video. I mean, especially they were getting in his face. They were right up there, angrier and angrier as time went on. I mean, this guy is, you know, trying to find his way uh, to an open door. And, uh, you know, I got to be honest, I was concerned for this guy's safety when I saw this. I was, too. And I'm glad to hear that State Senator Grothman didn't feel like he was uh, at risk of any kind of uh, physical confrontation. But it certainly seemed that way. And it especially seemed that way, Sean, uh, when w many of these protesters had to shout at the top of their lungs, ironically enough, peaceful, peaceful, to try and, and get the mob to settle down. And what we've seen is the rule of law supplanted by the rule of the mob. It is no surprise because these kinds of uh, power tactics are uh, par for the course uh, for many big labor thugs. It, it's no surprise that in the aftermath of a Democrat congressman, we talked about this last week, Michael Capuano, telling these union thugs to get a little bloody on the streets that we have uh, this kind of, of confrontation near riot, I think was the term that uh, Senator Grothman used when he initially described it. And I think that's exactly right. My question for many of the unions whose signs were represented by this mob, including Ask Me, including the United Food and Commercial Workers, and including, of course, the Purple Army, the Purple Shirted Army of the Service Employees International Union. My question is this. Is this the kind of behavior that you think is making America's children proud? Because, as I recall, President Obama, in the aftermath of the Tucson massacre, called on all of us to engage in behavior that would make America's children proud. And yeah. I think America's children will probably be pretty humiliated and embarrassed well, I mean, by the uh, behavior of these so-called adults. You know, I, I, well, I want to make a comparison, though, to, to the Tea Party movement, which was accused of being racist and, and called all sorts of names, uh, AstroTurf, which, interestingly, a lot of these union members are coming in from other states. But, you know, we saw signs Mubarak plus Hitler equals dictator Scott Walker. Uh, Hitler outlawed unions, too. Uh, Hitler with a caption, separated at birth. Um, you know, and it goes on and on, uh, you know, Mussolini, Hitler, Nazi. Compare that to if, if any Tea Party group used similar signs, this would be, you know, the talk of, of the country for weeks, if not days. Sure. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. I think the, the profanity, the sexual vulgarities that have been hurled, particularly at conservative politicians, you had Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish on uh, about a month ago, Sean, talking about uh, what a, a liberal, supposed progressive talk show host said to her when she was trying to recruit private businesses to her state. And I think what it shows you is that this is not merely about collective bargaining. It's not merely about uh, 
union issues and the budget there. It's much larger than that. They are using and exploiting this financial and economic crisis to organize. That's what it's all about. We've seen it from the White House. They try to whitewash their fingerprints off of it. But you can see that organizing for America's handprints and, and fingerprints are all over it. And even at this moment, they're using it to canvas, to register voters, to get people fired up for 2012. You know, and me... at the expense of what? At the expense of civility and public discourse. Well, and that's the ironic part of this. When the president met with the governors, uh, he talked about civilities for the unions, but not for Scott Walker. You know, there, there was an assembly woman, you're going to blanking die, that was said by another assembly man. Uh, that yes. got very little attention. Here's, here's what I don't understand, though. Because if we compare, now, the president basically is the boss of all these federal workers. Um, federal employees do not have the right for collective bargaining on wages or benefits. In the case of Wisconsin, they'll still have the right to have collective bargaining uh, for their pay hikes. And by the way, federal employees, uh, and I'm sure the president knows this, that the average federal worker pays twice as much for health insurance as what they're asking for, for example, in Wisconsin. What I don't understand, why aren't these... these uh, Union members and these people protest, why aren't they at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? Why don't they go where there are much bigger issues and far fewer benefits? Yes. Yeah, well, that is the bottom line, Sean. Why the double standard? And, of course, as I said, this is because it's about gaining some sort of political and electoral advantage against their enemies. You don't see them uh, crashing at the, the Capitol building uh, here in New York State, for example, where Andrew Cuomo is, is tightening the belt and going after many of these same unions. Uh, they're starting to spend money against him now and oppose uh, some of his fiscal discipline. But you don't see the uh, Cuomo as Nazi posters. Well, not yet anyway. They may soon well, do it, it as well uh, if they're threatened, if they're threatened. But, uh, but I think with particular regard, regard to the teachers' union, this is, this is what I wrote about in my column today. Uh, these people are inspired by Saul Alinsky. It's all about rules for radicals, agitation, collaboration. It's not about the children. It's not about fairness. It's not about actual education for the kids. And these people are willing to actually sacrifice jobs and go ahead and invite the layoffs that Governor Walker wanted to avoid in Wisconsin because they have a larger goal, and that is securing their own political power for eternity. All right, Michelle Malkin, good to see you. Thank you. You bet. Take care. And the chaos in Libya rages. Is Gaddafi on the brink? Also, America's attempt to bring justice to Gaddafi. Will the Libyan leader be prosecuted for crimes from the past? That and much more straight ahead. Even as anti-government forces continue to repel the violent attacks of Muammar Gaddafi's thugs, the dictator himself is managing to cling to power. Now, still defying, Gaddafi is now charging that the uprising against him is a conspiracy to get at Libyan oil reserves. Now, after vowing earlier today to fight to the last man, he warned that an American intervention in Libya would lead to a bloody civil war. But finally, the U.S. is increasing the pressure on Gaddafi. Our naval and air forces are inching closer to Libya, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton revealed yesterday that there is a chance the administration will prosecute Gaddafi for the 1988 Lockerbie bombing, which killed 270 people, including 190 Americans. Now, many charge that Gaddafi ordered the attack personally, so we can only hope the Obama administration will get a chance to bring him to justice. And joining me now with analysis is former Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz is back with us. Paul, welcome back. Good to be here. All right, first of all, um, what do you make of the big picture? When we look at all of these countries in the Middle East, from Egypt to Tunisia, you know, to Algeria, moving from the Mideast to North Africa, what do you make of why all of this is happening at this moment? It's hard to say why it happened at this particular moment, but something like this, I think, really was inevitable. And many of us have been saying for quite some time that the seeming stability that's provided by these Arab dictators is a phony stability. It's a false stability. And... You know, President Bush said, and I think quite powerfully and correctly, he said too often in the past, we've sacrificed freedom in the interest of stability and we've ended up with neither. And yeah. now we're seeing that, st that false stability collapse. The, the good news is it's collapsing in most places, uh, and most importantly in Tunisia and in Egypt, the, the biggest, most important Arab country, in a relatively peaceful manner with, I think, a real prospect for a positive political outcome, and that is good news, and we're lucky it happened because why, why we didn't are have you much so, to do with it. Why are you so confident when 85% of the Egyptian people support the death penalty 
uh, Sharia law for those that are non-believers, apostates. I mean, that, that is, these are significant poll numbers that show support for the radicalization of uh, Egypt. Sean, I, I've seen that poll and I found it disturbing. I've seen other polls that suggest different results. I'm not sure we can trust polls terribly well. I think, look, I, half the population of Egypt are women. And I don't think most of them want to be sent back to some 8th century version uh, to, a, to basically an Islamic dictatorship like they have in Iran. Look, I don't know that. I mean, it, it, the future is up for grabs. But the, the quality of the people demonstrating the kinds of things they said, the constant expression for freedom, I think is, is a better start than we might have expected. The, the bad kind of start is where it happens with a violent revolution organized by the most violent groups, by groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, and that hasn't happened. So, so far, we're lucky. I does, does Gaddafi don't think he survive can the this? Future. I don't think Gaddafi can survive. I think the question is how much damage and destruction he does before he goes, and I think the sooner he goes, certainly the better for the Libyan people, but I think the better for the whole region. What, what is your general take on the way the administration, I mean, there seems to be conflict even within the administration as to you know, how this is all going. It seems to me that, you know, you can't have the, the vice president, the secretary of state, the president of the United States, you know, as even Ruth Marcus of Washington Post liberal, you know, wrote about he's too little, too late behind on almost every issue. And there's not, there's not been a coherent message from, from the administration. I mean, what do you, how do you grade their leadership? Well, I think it's certainly been terribly slow to date, but I'd like to get them to focus on what they can do now and do urgently. And, stop this constant hand-wringing about how difficult everything is. Let's start with humanitarian assistance. The United States is very good in a crisis at delivering medical supplies and food and other emergency needs. Yeah, and but doesn't that free up more money for, for the terrorist elements, radical elements? I mean, we're freezing assets, billions of dollars for Gaddafi I'm and I'm not Mubarak. talking about sending it to Gaddafi. I'm talking about sending it yeah, to I the liberated that. city of Benghazi. But doesn't, I mean, it, those but doesn't it free up money for radicals to then if, if the people are getting support, that they can buy weaponry? Basically, you have to realize that Libya is now divided between a small clique led by Gaddafi that has terrorized the city of Tripoli and has people intimidated into silence still, and most of the other cities of the country, including the second largest one, which is in the east, Benghazi, where people have assumed control. It seems to be orderly. It seems to be peaceful. But there is a big shortage of medical supplies, a looming shortage of food. We could be helping to bring supplies in across the Egyptian border or into the port of Benghazi. And I don't know why we're not doing that. All right. Something thanks. else that, that I think we should be doing uh, is talking to these new leaders. In Benghazi, they have elected a national council which represents each of the liberated cities of Libya. We should have somebody in there talking to them, find out who they are, find out what they think, and find out what kind of help they need. All right, Paul Wolfowitz, good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, time now to check in with the one and only. <laughs> Red of it. Do you have a cold? Do I have a cold? Why? Do I look like I have a cold? No, I just, I thought I heard you sound like you were, had a cold. And what, she, you're like, I, I hadn't even said anything. I, you I asked me if I had a cold. For two How weeks, I? and I was here every single day <laughs> fighting my cold, fighting through it. Okay, so you have a cold. No, I, well, the, the remnants of it. So what's on the record tonight in 20 minutes? Uh, well, we have a lot tonight, including Speaker of the House. Uh, John Boehner is going to go on the record tonight, plus uh, Governor Rick Perry from Texas. And we're going to, of course, bring you the latest on what's going on in Wisconsin. That showdown is only getting wilder. And we have so much more. Back to you. Hope your cold's better. I'm getting there. All right, Greta, in uh, 20 short minutes from right now, let not your heart be troubled. Our great, great, great American panel is next.